been praying this morning that we would all have listening ears and hearts this morning as we look at this message. Uh, we're looking today at continuing the idea of the power of repentance in our life. The power of repentance allows us to come to a place where we can begin to actively establish boundaries and we can actively carry out accountability in our life. That's very important for us as believers because one of the things we struggle with and deal with and we've talked about several times during this series is the fact that we sin, we fail, we become fearful of something and and then at that point we we kind of lose connection with God. We we kind of go uh well I I don't know if God really has the power to see me through all of this. And we begin to question that. Well, that's a call in our minds where we need to repent of that sin. We need to repent of that fear that we have. And the activity that we know is sin in our life, we sometimes come to God and we very remorsefully repent or we call it repenting we confess our sin before God only many times we know we're really going to do it again and we confess and we do it again and we confess and we do it again and there's a couple of different things that happens we either come to the place where we believe that the God we serve is not powerful enough to do anything about our sin or we begin to believe that there's nothing in our own life that can produce any change at all I think it's interesting this a couple of weeks ago when I was listening to something, a, a pastor named Eric Mason made this statement. Confession without true repentance. True repentance would mean we change our mind about our sin, about our God, about the way we respond to things. We change. So confession without true repentance is nothing more than emotional abuse. Wow. So you wonder why you're so beat up. Because you and I go through this exercise of emotionally abusing ourselves, and we call it repentance. We, we go, well, we've confessed our sin. Yes, that's important. But have we changed our mind about our sin? We've confessed our sin, but have we changed our behavior toward how we do life? You see, if we don't change our behavior, if we don't change our mind, if we don't truly repent, then progress is stopped. And we begin to believe it's God's issue when God is sitting there saying, look, remember the other day when we used the passage out of James and we emphasized the fact that James was talking to Christians and giving us hands-on things that we need to do in order to restore those right relationships. So today I want us to talk about that. I want us to think about that because uh, I think it's it, Joe Dallas, uh, a man I've admired for years, read, and he's spoken at our churches several times. He made this statement Giving up our confessed sin is the first step, but giving up sin is never enough. You have to now set up a structure to keep from going back to it. In other words, it's time to stop weeping and start working. 
Listen, some of us have come to God totally broken, totally in tears, totally saying, God, I give this up to you. I want you to take this away from me. I want you to change my heart. I want you to change my life. I want change only to not allow God to change us. Because, folks, we're uncomfortable with change. All of us. Yes, we're, we're, we're comfortable with certain changes because we know those are inevitable. But when you start talking about changing my heart, get me out of the norm, get me out of the comfortable, we become a little resistant to that. I want us to recognize something this morning. We'll go through this sermon. The, the first three points we'll move through pretty fast, and the fourth point we'll camp out there a while, okay? The first thing I want us to see is a Scripture passage that we're looking at specifically today. It's from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 and 25. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run? But only one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the game, games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. We're in a race. You and I as believers are in a race. And do you know what? You and I in a, as believers aren't in a race all by ourselves. We don't even get to choose the race. God is the one who assigns the race to you. God is the one who gives you the breath, the strength, the income, the location, the cultural background, everything you need to run your race. You don't need to be another person. You don't need to be another gender. You don't need to be another uh, country. You don't need to be anything else than what you are to complete the race God has assigned to you. But we do need to set up an accountability. And the first accountability is that I am accountable to God. He's my coach. If I were running in a race, and I know what this is like. Uh, I remember when I was in high school and we used to play football. And in the U.S., that's tackle football. And... Uh, one of the things our coach would always have us do is run track. Uh, I was never a person who really liked running. And so I was the guy at the back of the pack that always thought I was winning the race because all these runners were behind me. They were getting ready to lap me, you know. But if I, I, I never ran those races to win. I just ran them to satisfy the requirement. And many times in our spiritual life, we're not running to win. We're just running to fulfill some sort of requirement that we have established in our brain so that we can, by our own standard, meet some type of goal to say, we did pretty good. I tell you what, when I, ra when I ran those races, I wasn't running a race because in my mind it wasn't a race. It wasn't something I was going to win. It wasn't even something I was going to attempt to win. It was just something I was going to do. You and I, we run our lives like that sometimes. When you're in that type of setting, when the coach comes to you and says, here, I want to help you improve your game, you say, that's okay, I'm all right. 
when you, when you get to a point in the race and you go and your coach is pushing you and yelling at you, you may have times. I can remember a time, one time, I, I passed my coach. I was running rather slowly, but I passed my coach and he looked at the guy in front of me and the distance between me and him and he says, Tanner, catch him. And I did. There are times when we have those spurts where we really do it well. We do great. And we look at ourselves and going, hmm, we're pretty good, aren't we? We do that spiritually. God, look at how wonderful I am because I did my Bible study for three months in a row. God, look at how wonderful I am because I started the day with you and, and I prayed with you and I actually prayed throughout the day. may have been the first day in a month that I did it, but I did it. Look how good I am. And you know what? As Christians, another thing Joe Dallas points out that I like is the fact that he says it's easier to minimize our failures and our sins in our life when we're being obedient in some areas. Wow, God, help me understand you're here to coach me to do better. You're the one I'm accountable to. You're the one that I need to check in with daily because you at the end of the day are going to hold me accountable to every single thing that's going on in my life. You know everything. It's very important that I understand that. Romans chapter 14 verse 12 says, So then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. That means, when it says an account, that means a detail of everything. That's not just, oh, I did all right. It's not like when your husband comes home from work and you say, How did work go today? Oh, I went fine. God's going to go, Butch, how did your life go today? Oh, it went fine. No, I don't want to know how fine it went. I want an hourly detail. I want a minute-by-minute play. I want to know where your thoughts were when you were trying to make this decision and you weren't relying on me. I want to know where your actions were when you responded in a negative way to something that should have been a growth time. I want to know what's going on in the depth of your heart while you're in the midst of trying to worship me. Because, folks, I know very clearly that you can sit in this service listening to Scripture read, listening to the songs, and be miles away from God. God says, I am holding you accountable. Be accountable to me. There's nothing hidden from God. He says, every careless word we say, every careless thought we have, every motivation that drives us will be something we stand accountable to Him. And you know what? We kind of blow that off because we go, hey, but we're in heaven. Do you know God's goal for you isn't to make it to heaven? Jesus didn't come to save you and me so we could go to heaven. Jesus came to save you and me so that we could experience life with Him, directed by Him, guided by Him, walking with Him right now so that we could affect our families, so that we could affect our community, so that we could affect everybody. But we won't do it if we're not accountable to the coach. When the coach says something, don't say, I'd rather do it a different way. Say, what do you see that needs changed? And help me work on it. The second thing I want us to see is that as a believer, I am also accountable to other believers. 
Now you see, th this one is something that we, we really we struggle with because if, if, if I, may, I may have a conversation here temporarily here. Okay, Sangu, how are you? Oh, I'm fine, I'm fine. How's your day going? Oh, it's wonderful. God's been blessing. I don't know what, what's going on in her mind or heart or soul, but it may have been she had some terrible news this morning. She may be heartbroken over something. She may be struggling with something. But when we as fellow believers sometimes meet in this place, we're wonderful. We're godly. We're spiritual. This is amazing what God does. It's sort of like the kid. One day during a pastor's sermon, the pastor was throwing up a baseball, and, and he goes, do you know what this is? And one little kid says, I think I know what it is, but it's got to have something to do with Jesus. <laughs> you know, when we walk into this place, for some reason, we turn on a different mode of operation. Listen, brothers and sisters in Christ, we can't be encouraging to one another, building of one another, when we lie to one another all the time. We are called to be accountable to one another, to love one another, to encourage one another, to motivate one another, to speak to one another in ways that are important to building each other up. And we won't understand the moment of need if we don't understand where your struggle is. Now, I'm not saying when somebody asks you, how are you doing, you dump everything out. That's just like in an accountability setting, depending on your accountability with different people, you don't always dump all the information. But you know what? You can dump a lot of the truth without having to give a lot of the details. You can say, hey, I'm struggling with my integrity right now. I'm struggling with remaining faithful right now. I'm struggling with walking with God in a daily basis with my Bible study or my prayer right now. I'm struggling. You can talk about your struggles so that myself or yourself or, or somebody else can encourage you as you're needed. And you know what? When we come to this place and we worship together, we need to be people who are stimulating one another and encouraging one another. In Hebrews chapter 2 verse 20 or chapter 10 verse 24 it says, "And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. The Bible talks about older men and women in the church should be good examples and encouragers and models for younger men and women to, to grow in their faith in Christ. Uh, it talks about peers should encourage one another and build off of one another and strengthen one another. It talks about leaders being held to a higher position of leadership or, or a higher position of accountability. And so when we look at this, we understand that together we are better. You know, e Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 9 says, Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. Now, now, let me just give you an illustration here. I think it's an illustration most of you will get because of the fact when, when I came to Hong Kong, I was a little bit bigger than I am now. Okay? A and for four years while I've been here, the first four years, I had my own goals, my own accountability, my own idea of, of things, and, and it was just an accountability between me and God, you know. Just us. Just us two. We're good at that. And, and I had a goal to lose some weight. All right? Being accountable to me. See, we tend to let ourselves slide a little. We give ourselves extra room that we wouldn't dare give a person beside us. 
And we look at other people around us and we go, why in the world? And, and we fuss about them when we give ourselves all kinds of room. In four years of attempting to lose weight, following a strict plan, doing all this type of stuff, I lost a whopping 2.8 kilometers, or kilo, kil, kilograms, <laughs> kilometers. <laughs> Boy, that'd be great. <laughs> KG. All right, think about that. That's not much. Four years work. That's the encouraging, isn't it? But you know what? Before my 60th birthday, two years ago, I'm getting close to before my 62nd birthday now, I got serious. And I knew for me to get serious, I have to have someone I'm accountable to. So actually, two people agreed to help hold me accountable. And I reported to those two people every single day for one solid year. And with one of those people, I've kept on reporting with and being accountable to on about an every other week basis now. In the year of being accountable, I lost 26 and a half kg. All right? Now, I want you to understand, is the Scripture wrong when it says two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor? There's a physical example of that at work. I want us to understand that applies spiritually too. But it applies in all areas. We need to understand God has our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ here to help us grow, to help us mature, help us build in our life. Proverbs 27, 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. So you and I need to understand we are accountable to God. We're accountable to each other. All right? The third thing, there is a set standard I'm accountable for. Now, when you look at the world, the world doesn't, the world's standards change all the time. I mean, goodness, with COVID, how, how many times have the rules on COVID changed? I mean, we were told originally if everybody in Hong Kong got... If 70% of the people in Hong Kong got the first shot, then we would be back to normal. Then it got to where 80%, then 90%. Then maybe if 70% if of the people got the second shot, then it would be back to normal. Now it's if 90% of the people get the third shot, we'll be back to normal. Listen, folks, the, the thing changes all the time. In 2030, they'll say, when we get to the 140th shot and we have 95% of the people, we'll be safe. You know what? That's just one example. The world's business standards, the world's operating standards, the world's safety standards, the world's who's more important standards, the world it, moral standards, all these things change. You don't believe they change? Just look at what's happened in our world in the last 10 years, morally. Wow. I want you to know something, though. For a Christian, your standard never changes. You are held to God's Word. You, you see, God is my coach. You're my teammates. I want to follow my coach's leadership. I want to run the race in a way that honors you as teammates. And I want to make sure that I don't disqualify myself in the race or misunderstand the race. I want to make sure I know the rules. One of the things... I know for you and I, we 
we see God's rules as limits. Most of the time, we view them as negatives. And there are a lot of times in our life that we look and we go, okay, if this edge of the step is the limit, how close to the limit can I get without falling off? Let me tell you what I know personally is that in my own life, if I'm testing the limits, I'm not seeking to be like Jesus. When you're testing the limits, you're not seeking to be like Jesus either. You see, when we test the limits, we're pushing against God. And we're saying, you're my coach. I'm running for the team. But I'm going to do it my way. You know the best way. You know all the rules. But I'm going to keep pushing this direction. We'll never win. And we're not running to win when we're doing that. And the scripture is telling us, run to win. And if I want to run to win, I want to know where he wants me to go. I want to know what he wants me to focus on. I want to be wise. Matter of fact, the scripture, Jesus uses an example. A wise man is one who builds his house on the rock. That's the word. He hears the word. Listen, it says, he hears the words of mine that's the person he calls wise in James chapter 1 verse 25 it says but one who looks intently that's somebody who meditates studies and applies the one who looks intently at the perfect law the law of liberty liberty what do you mean liberty isn't God's law limiting no it's liberating and abides in it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer. This man will be blessed in what he does. So, we've got a coach, we've got teammates, we've got rules. Now, I want to track my personal accountability. So if I'm going to track my personal accountability, some, some elements I want us to think about is first focusing on the goal. What is your goal? You and I as Christians want to reflect what God is in our life. We want to be a mirror image of Him. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, it says... But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. Be clear about who you're becoming. Begin to lay out those goals. I want to look like Christ, so how is that going to affect my business? How is that going to affect my education? How is that going to affect my life? I can tell you, for me personally, U.S. 7th grade year, 8th grade year, ninth grade year of school were difficult times. I didn't make very good grades. I really struggled partly because I had no idea where I was headed. But in my first year of high school, almost at the end of that year, I felt God call me to preach. And from that point on, I was an A student. Why? Because I got really, really smart in that summer. No, not at all. 
I had a direction and I knew that it was important for me to know some things and so I applied myself because of my new direction. Listen, a lot of people, you know, I, I talk to people all the time and they'll say, well, you know, what are you going to do when you grow up? I don't know. Nobody's told me yet. And I understand that from this culture. I understand that from different things. But ultimately, what's God want you to do with your life? That's more important than anybody else who tells you at all. And so we need to have a clear understanding of what God's plan is for us. And we need to put aside those things that are not pursuing what God wants. Biblical wisdom and understanding is taking evil and setting it aside. Now, you know what? We sometimes, we look and go, but I have set evil aside. I don't do any of those bad things. You know what the Bible talks about as being evil? Not praying. Not seeking God's wisdom. Those are evil? Yes, they are. You know, what we think of evil is, I didn't murder anybody, and I didn't, I didn't steal anything, and I didn't do... Listen, that's our standard, not our coaches. God didn't call you to fulfill your life or my life based on our own image of idea. He called you to be what you can be with Him, and it'd be amazing. He called you to run to win. So in going back to that analogy of me in the race in, in, in high school, he would have said, but you're in a race. You're not here just to finish. Run it to win it. I guarantee you it takes on a different mindset. What is your focus? Are you interested in winning or are you just interested in playing? Big difference. God didn't call you to play Christian. God didn't call me to play Christian. God called us to run to win. And you know what? My deal at one point was yeah, but God, these other people are so far out in front of me. He said, Butch, this is your race. Run it to win it. They're running to win their race. Everybody's focused on their own race. So run it to win it. What's your goal? What does God have in store for you? The second thing, we need to establish new routines. What is your routine of life? You know, um, are you a morning person? <laughs> I got tickled because Jeremiah was telling me he, he's going to have to be getting up earlier. Well, is that your normal? It may be normal for some. But it can become normal for everybody if you want it to become normal, if it works within your schedule, if it's what God is designing you to do. You can change your habits. You can change your routines. And, you know, we, we, you may be going right now, you know what, I would like to be a person who doesn't do evil, and I do want the Bible to be a part of my life. And here's, here's a thing I want you to be aware of. Some of you are saying, well, I can't get up. I, I, I can't read the four chapters in the Bible every day. Well, who said you had to read four? Who said you had to even read a full chapter? 
But what you need to do is you need to take the Word of God and put it into your heart every day so that you are meditating on it, so that you are working it into your life, so that you're asking the Spirit of God to do something with you. You don't have to get up three hours early to have your prayer time and your Bible study time, but I can guarantee you this, as you and I begin to develop new routines where we're putting Bible study in our life, where we're putting prayer time in our life, where we're putting daily worship in our life, where we're putting accountability in our life with someone else to help us in growing, we will see that in those times we will move to want more. We need to be at work allowing God to move us in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, it says, But the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. The third thing I want us to see is crafting new habits. And I particularly chose this word crafting because it indicates that there is work involved in doing it. You know, you read different people on on habits in seven days you can start a new habit in 21 days you can start a new habit in 90 days you can start a new habit let me tell you what you may be able to start a new habit in seven days or 21 days or 90 days or you may do something 90 days in a row and then just walk away from it You see, establishing a new habit isn't about a routine of an activity. It's a routine of an activity that changes your heart. And as your heart changes, then your habit changes. I've watched people who have done the same thing every single day for one solid year and never pick it up again. It's, did they not create a habit? No, they didn't. They did something for a year, but that wasn't a habit. A habit is something you just do arbitrarily, naturally, because you've become someone who yearns for that from your heart. And so... I want you and I to work about establishing a new habit. It takes time. You know, I've always been a big NASA fan. Uh, I've enjoyed the NASA program throughout the year. I've I've been to the space centers. I've I've been to the rocket plants. I've I've seen where they test fire the engines. I've, I've watched where astronauts were training underwater I I really enjoy that but you know we we watch it in an exhilaration of that launch of whatever vehicle it is that they're going up on and we see that happen in moments we don't realize that from the time it began assembly, I mean, everything's together, everything's ready, it just needs to be assembled for launch. It's taken them three weeks. Three shifts of workers a day, three weeks to prepare for the launch. When the crawler starts to move out to the launch pad, it moves at a whopping speed of less than one half of a mile per hour. It's moving millions, literally millions, over 20 million pounds. And the crawler itself weighs over 6 million pounds. Can you imagine? And it's crawling one inch at a time. But you see, we see the launch. We look at other people's lives and we go, look, look at how they've got it together. 
They didn't get there overnight, folks. They didn't develop this overnight. You and I need to understand that we can create habits, but it has to take time, and it has to come from a change of heart. Now, this week I read something on Instagram that I really enjoyed. I actually sent it on to several people, but it said this about prayer. If you don't feel like praying, force it. Because something else is forcing you not to pray. So you either, you get a choice. Who wins this battle for this habit? Who wins this battle to plant this into my heart? And then Galatians chapter 6 verse 9 says, Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary we, we want to persevere we want to go ahead we want to move forward we want to make things work well so the last thing I want us to think about is when we're accountable when we're establishing these ba boundaries we need to be honest with my I, I need to be honest with myself and with others you know what the first person we'll lie to is us and that lie is simply, I don't have to be truthful with this other person. It won't, help, it won't hurt. Again, what I'm saying, you don't have to lay out all the details, but you need to get with somebody to be accountable with that person so you can see results in different things. And when they sit there and say, Hey, did you, did you have your Bible study time all week this week? And you could honestly say, No. Okay, tell me a little bit about what happened. Well, you know, I, I woke up late. <laughs> uh, my, I, I didn't hear my alarm. I, I got busy uh, real fast. I had to get an earlier an appointment. I had to do all these things. And okay, what are some things you could have done throughout the day during a break time or something like that where you could have at least touched base with that? Since, I mean, you've got, a, you've got an iPhone uh, you know, you can read the Bible anywhere. Uh, you don't have to have a book in front of you. What are some things you could do this next week if you get in that same situation? Because the reality is you're going to get there. But if you begin to have an accountability partner that begins to help you think through all these thoughts of, okay, uh, you know, right now you tell me you didn't meet your goal. How's that make you feel? What are you thinking about? What are you thinking of doing? How can we change that? How would you like to change that? If you and I are being honest in those, then those will be growing moments where we will grow to be more like what God intends for us to be. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 25 says, Therefore laying aside falsehood, speak truth each one of you with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. Do you realize, and this is one thing I don't believe any of us, including myself, fully realize. It's like Leonard Ravenhill said, Revival will start truly sweeping across the world when Christians repent. I believe personally that we do not understand how critical it is for us individually to stand with God and to follow His lead and live out our Christian walk. We don't see ourselves as that important. After all, we're just one person. It really doesn't make a lot of difference. But it does. You're one person who carries the light of Christ to your family, to your co-workers, 
to your classmates, to your internet friends, to your social media folks. You're one person who will dramatically impact life as you and I become accountable to God. Today, as a believer in Jesus Christ, would you accept the call to listen to the coach, play with your teammates, live by the rules, so that you and I can grow to be what we can. Find an accountability partner, someone you trust, someone you love, and begin to grow together in your walk with the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your love and guidance. We ask you to lead us to be in a point in our life where we will give you everything that we are. That, Lord, we won't back away. That we won't live by excuses. But that, Lord, we will continually lift you up and allow you to work in our hearts and our minds to make an absolute difference in who we are. Thank you that when we repent, it allows us to build accountability and have a place where that is actually joyful. In Jesus' name, amen.